so, second morning lecture will be Peter on are zero interest rates and zero discount rates possible? Over to Peter. Thank you. This previous half hour, or the previous hour, we um, glanced over whatever we had done this week, why it was important to have these reflexes. And since this uh, seminar is dedicated to the difference between the uh, American Austrians and the, um, well, I should, I'm, I'm always tempted to say neo Austrians, but then Ludwig said, no, please use um, new Austrians, otherwise, he has to change the name. So I will say um, the new Austrians. This difference um, between them, we, we, we left already behind us. It's uh, fundamental in the progress of, of science. And we've seen that the originary rate of interest that he used um, was a bit, well, obfuscated, let's say, and, and undefined. Um, it was based on the wrong dichotomy, the wrong dichotomy that is used in law between present good and um, future good. And we re or Professor Fekete reset that paradigm to an exchange of wealth for income and income for wealth. Now it is usable. We don't blame Menger for that, by the way, either. By resetting the paradigm, Professor Fekete, he, he did offer to look at the phenomenon of interest in a new way. Uh, which is not laden with emotions like debt and credit. Um, and I did give you the example of the Spanish crown and the Bank of Amsterdam. So, um, we have arrived at a model that gives us an equal and a just exchange in the most irreducible form of credit, which has two sources. By the way, credit has two sources, which is Savings on the one hand, that command interest, and social circulating capital, or bills, which uh, command a discount. This lecture is about zero interest and also zero discount. And if I may add to that, we can even go in one, and the same go, we can even go negative. And I don't think this has been treated um, in any of, of the previous lectures, or nor in, in um, Gold's uh, Standard University life before, I think. I may be wrong. Um, I think this is the first link from microeconomics to macroeconomics, namely the theory of credit and interest. And from this view of partnerships, we can construct a much larger, uh, well, and certainly a much more realistic view. And the view of uh, equilibrium models, um, equilibrium supply and demand, is a bit lacking. Why is it lacking? Well, it does uh, lack an entire third dimension. It lacks the quality variable. When I was first year economics student, this was a thing that baffled me because I came from parents with a with commerce background. And the first thing they did when, when you know, you have to settle on a price, well, okay, you, you can vary the quality and then you can give him what he wants. I mean, that's what shopkeepers do. But apparently that um, is a bit difficult to um, um, bring to first-year students. Uh, personally, I think this, this model of this equilibrium is not difficult at all. First-year students would, would grasp this no, in, in, in 10 <coughs> seconds flat. It would, it would become more difficult if you're already trained in, <laughs> in equilibrium. Um, then it would be difficult to understand any of it. So this disequilibrium model um, allows this um, quality, quantity, and price nexus. Um, and I, pr I said, you know, I, pr I see it as a breakthrough. 
That is, of course, if your name is not Larry West or Gary North, eh? there will always be people who will not understand. Okay, that was a little nasty remark. Um, there is also a second link from microeconomics to macroeconomics, and that is the, the real bills, the, circuit, the, the theory of total uh, of, of, of real bills. In that form, of course, the both pictures give you the uh, entire um, John Exeter pyramid. And in fact, D, both links are necessary to uh, have a good look at what um, an economy with total credit uses uh, would look like. That is your link to macroeconomics. And here is a point where um, there is a book about the American, that the American Austrians have written, namely their link with um, macroeconomics. I forget, I forget the, the name of the author. Um, I did, it's, it's, it's actually downloadable. And I did read, I, I leave through it. I can't say that I read it from back to cover. Um, it stands out a bit by its lack of links to macroeconomics. And that is because, in my opinion, they're rejecting the real bills of Adam Smith. They're missing a big link. And that, I think, is, as the professor has said, the Achilles heel of the whole Austrian econo American economic, sorry, American Austrian economic school is. So it's a, it's a huge mistake to dismiss Adam Smith just because he's old or because he is a classical economist. Um, there is, in fact, a m more modern economist, and he's not even an Austrian. His name is Rittershausen. He's written extensively on the real bills, and I mean, he doesn't, he's not biased. You cannot say that Rittershausen is biased. He was a German. He came, if, any, if anything, he came from the historical school. But look, he did um, endorse indirectly the whole real bills, uh, directly the real, the real bills doctrine, and indirectly our view on it. And this whole introduction uh, this morning was, in fact, necessary to bring the topic of interest, which is related to savings and also to discounts. Interest and discount are not the same. Rudy has made that very clear. Um, we have already stated that interest is driven by the propensity to save and that the relationship is inverse. Discount is not interest, despite whatever you may be thinking, and I was thinking the same thing um, when I was like 19 or 20. Uh, well, I didn't know any better and I paid some good professors then. Well, I shouldn't say good professors. I paid some university good money. I should go and ask it back. Actually. And this propensity to consume is inverse to um, the discount rate. And I've already said that the two may independently go their own way. And just now we will investigate whether they can both go to zero or whether they can both go to negative territories. Interest is the limit to infinite gold hoarding. Mises knew that, he saw that. Um, and it's obvious that interest, with the existence, the phenomenon of, of, of interest, gold hoardings, savings, they are actually drawn out of their hoarding. They are drawn out of the foxholes, if you like. And no sooner interest rates fall below the marginal saver or the marginal bondholder's time preference, and in protest, he will do what old Mr. or Dr. or Professor Fullerton, I'm not sure, what Fullerton has already described, uh, a century and a half ago, and we, we call it the Fullerton effect. No sooner as it do interest rates drop below the marginal type reference, and guess what? Under a gold standard, he will exchange 
is gold bonds for cash, in gold coins that is. And I don't want to enter on your territory uh, of the next lecture. But he will force the banks to liquidate bonds, which will rein in their fractural reserve capabilities and raise the interest rate in the process. What will they do if you ask under a fiat standard? Well, of course, the same will happen, except that now one cannot rein in the fractional reserve banking uh, phenomenon of, of, the, of the banking industry. They will have to cash in for irredeemable notes. So it takes out a bit of, well, it takes out the teeth out of the uh, system. Note that there is still protest possible. You can cash in for irredeemable notes, but you can protest by proceeding to the gold market. And that is what we witnessed today. That is what we witnessed en masse in 1999. But even before that, because the fiat standard started, let's say, in 71, and even before, but let's, let's I mean, if you want to know why there is such a thing as a bubble, a real estate bubble, then this is it. Interest rates falling below marginal time preference, be that high interest rates or low interest rates, even under high interest rates, it may still be not enough. And you will develop bubbles in this real estate or anything, anything that is named under John Exeter's pyramid. The smart investor would actually go for gold, if he can. But we also know that gold is not really everywhere possible to purchase. There are countries where it is illegal. And it was illegal in, at the time I went to live in South Africa. You could not get Krugerrands unless there were proof Krugerrands. So um, the market price for Krugerrands is like astronomical. That, that it, what was a top, typical ripoff. So I am willing to concede that due to the uh, utterly uninformed state, perhaps of people, not in all cases, but gold and silver should have been um, the first choice where they were not. Um, perhaps even. Um, there is a role for the Goldman Sachs people, or, you know, I'm, I'm just calling them the Goldman Sachs people. Let's call them the phenomenon of banks chasing people out of the gold market. On purpose, or maybe on instruction, that is possible. So, discount, uh, that, that's as far as, as interest rates is concerned, and now when, when we talk about discounts, they're, those reflect the propensity to consume, and the higher the discount rate is, the lower the propensity to consume. That is easy to understand. When discount rates are low, the propensity to consume will be high. When business is brisk, the marginal shopkeeper, who is in fact the market maker, because that model is slightly different. Um, no, not slightly, it is entirely different. The bill trader or the bill drawer, he will find liquidity for his bill from all over the world. Not only from his community, but, you know, this is international trade. And, and now you have multiplicities. This is m massive liquidity uh, coming to the market there. And that massive liquidity is there to compete for bills. Nobody wants to sit on coins. It's the last thing you want to do. You want to earn something on that. And if it is in the short term, you would go for a bill, and there you can go worldwide. So competing bidders, they will make sure that bill prices are as high as possible, and therefore bill discount rates are as low as possible, and commensurate with good business practices. On the other hand, if business is uh, slack, is lethargic, then uh, the opposite trends, um, tends to occur. Bill prices will be lower, which means that discount rates are higher. 
Um, and this has nothing to do with risk. It has everything to do with consumer preferences. Or oh, it is the same, of course, uh, the, the, the tendency to consume. Unfortunately, Mises did not recognize uh, the real Bill's doctrine. Um, he had rather chosen for the, um, the quantity theory. Um, had he seen or been aware of the complete picture, then the real Bill's doctrine would have exposed the logical flaw in the quantity theory. Uh, but the quantity theory, by the way, goes in logic under another name. It goes under the name of post hoc proctor hoc. Uh, in my opinion, that's not the official position. Or it might become, I don't know. Um, in fact, it is, it is more plausible that in response to, for instance, new mining discoveries, and here we come to the new mining of gold and why it is... Um, uh, why should that be not not be inflationary? Well, um, discount rates would be lowered. It, in fact, it enters gold. New gold enters the market through discounting bills, and those would be either the bills of where, wherever you go and consume as a little miner, or if it's a massive mining operation, you, there will be refineries drawing bills. So new mining supplies will enter the market through the bill market. It's obvious. Now, what will it do? This discount rates would be lowered. Why is that? Are you following? Discount rates on a refinery bill I mean, it's as good as liquid gold because there is new gold and the, the refinery just holds a little margin for its, um, uh, its own purposes. So, so discount rates would be very narrow. They would, these, these, these bills would circulate practically to nominal value. The nominal value of the bill that is. If it enters uh, through other discount, through discounting other bills, just imagine this: you know, um, new mining supplies from all these new mines. All these guys bring their new gold to the bank. One or two banks. What are these banks going to do? They have this heap of new coins, new gold. They're not going to sit on it either. They will purchase, they will do what a normal arbitrageur will do. They have local bills in circulation and there are other bills. Now, mind you, news travels fast. Hey? If there is a new mining discovery like the ones we had in, in, in the States, news travels fast. Everybody flocks there. But also, I mean, bankers have heard this and they want to, dis they want to um, Participate so gold flows also certain times en masse into a market. But it is the task of the arbitrageur, in this case the banker, who does selling a high, who, who just sells a bill which is high nominal rates, a uh, high nominal price, uh, an expensive bill, and he buys cheaper ones. And that equalizes discount rates. And that is, the, that is the mechanism by which gold gets dispersed worldwide. And that's the, rate, that's the reason why rates, even bill rates, this morning we added about interest rates, but bill rates equalize as well. So you could say there is only one rate, discount rate, because it is the mechanism whereby the collective wisdom of all the traders crystallizes in one one rate, and of course it gets upset once in a while, it is a disequilibrium model after all, but soon after, I mean it doesn't take months, it will be equalized. Having an earthquake there means bills on cement will be drawn. The discount rate will drop, everybody flocks there, sell high, buy low, you remember? And they will export cement there. 
until there's enough cement and the and the, and the the yield offered on a bill for cement loads or ship loads of cement, there will be no more profit opportunity. Of course, they have the cement, they had the money also, and they can now start building the uh, bridges that have collapsed due to the earthquake. And that does not necessarily mean that prices have risen in the process it was equalized through the bill discounting mechanism. And here we have it. Prices may go up and down, but if prices somewhere go up and down, it is not, absolutely not, because there is a mining discovery. That mining discovery is insignificant compared to the vast amount of mine mined gold or silver that we had, it enters in any case through the bill market and that's where it gets spread out. Um, so that's why I'm calling this whole quantity theory of uh, theory a, a, a post hoc propter hoc reasoning um, and I think I can make that hard. Now we have dealt with um, the quantity theory of money and the absence of a bill doctrine in the uh, American-Austrian school.